couple of markets as we go along. But uh, Prashant, we have a pretty interesting track lined up, and I think you know we've been talking to brokers, to exchanges, to get uh, a sense of institutional activity, to get a sense of the higher volumes that the market is seeing. Uh, and it's interesting to note what mutual funds have been doing as well because they've been battling dwindling flows to begin with, right? Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, I, uh, I, I so, so over the last couple of days, I, I've got a lot of WhatsApp forwards uh, basically uh, telling us that, well, these are stocks uh, which are going to be uh, classified as large caps. These are stocks which are moving up from being small caps to mid caps uh, and that kind of thing. I'm sure you would have, uh, have gotten those as well on market groups and others. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the sense I got is that many out there are thinking that, well, uh, because these stocks are now going to be reclassified as large caps or mid caps, uh, mutual funds have to buy them. So what I'm referring to is basically, uh, you know, the SEBI, SEBI definition of what constitutes as large caps, mid caps and small caps and what AMFI, which is the industry body for mutual funds, has to do every six months. It basically has to, uh, depending on the SEBI formula for the reclass as uh, for uh, uh, the large, mid and small cap part of the market, has to reclassify. Uh, uh, depending on where stocks have moved, some, some stocks now uh, are in the large cap category, some are now in the mid cap category and so on and so forth. So I just thought, let me just put this out and uh, uh, for our viewers, which I think will make, thing, uh, make things clearer. So we are expecting this list from Amphi by the end of this month or early uh, July. So we should have that. This will be effective from, the 20, uh, from August 20, which is this year, in August this year to January of 2021. So it's a six month period. And uh, mutual funds basically will have to align the schemes within one month of uh, this list being put out, which as I said is the end of the month or early July. Uh, what, what is the SEBI definition of uh, large, mid and small caps? They are on your list. Large caps are defined as the top 100 companies by market capitalization. Uh, mid caps are defined as 101st to 250th in market cap. And anything above 251 uh, in terms of market capitalization is defined in the uh, is uh, comes in the small cap category of stocks. There have been, of course, a lot of clamor that this definition itself should be expanded a little bit. There should be more leeway. Maybe make mid caps as you know 101 to 300 rather than 250 right now. But we'll see if that comes. But that has to come from SEBI. What we are talking about is what Amphi will do based on what the SEBI definition is uh, looking like as of now. So I just looked at uh, what Edelweiss has put out uh, in terms of their expectations, uh, in terms of what goes from which category to which and, and the stocks should come up on your screen. Uh, so uh, you know, stocks which are going to move up from mid caps to large cap category according to Edelweiss could be named like Abbott India, Indiprastha Gas, Adani Green, Cadilla Health, Healthcare, Alcom Laboratories and MRF. Actually two stocks kind of stand out in this list, Abbott and MRF. Uh, you know, you, you don't usually hear about them or, uh, in, in the institutional circle, so probably may, may make sense to watch out for those names. What could go from large caps to mid caps, stocks which have basically lost uh, their place in the top 100 in terms of market capitalization? Names like Pyramal Enterprises, ACC, Consign, Aerolac, ABB India, REC, Oracle, Z. Now let's come to small to mid cap part of the market. What, what will move up into uh, mid cap uh, list? So these are you know, 101 to 250 in terms of market capitalization overall. Escort, Central Bank, Ruchi Soya, Tube Investments, Metropolis, Jubilant Life, TTK Prestige, ITI, and JM Financials are, are, are some names. And what could go from, mid, from being mid cap to small cap? Uh, Apollo Tires, Sridham City, Ujjivan, MRPL, EIH, Future Life, uh, PNB Housing. The point is, these are all expectations by Edelweiss. Uh, and uh, we don't know at this point whether this, uh, these are the names which are going to find and it will depend on price changes now over the next couple of days as well. There is still time for the end of the month so this may vary. But this is what Edelweiss is putting out. The reason I wanted to put this up for our viewers, Surabhi, is basically because uh, of what I was talking about that it's, it's being made out to be that you know, mutual funds have to buy these stocks which will, you know, large cap funds will have to buy mid uh, new stocks which are coming into the large cap category from uh, the mid cap category or mid cap funds will have to buy stocks which are graduating from small cap to mid caps. The point is that is not the case. The last graphic should be on your screen. This is largely up to mutual funds, mutual fund schemes and mutual fund scheme managers. 
this uh, you know the reason i'm saying this is because if you look at equity scheme classification and what sebi defines it as if you are a large cap fund you have to have 80% minimum in large caps but 20% can be others if you are a mid cap fund you have to have 65% in mid cap stocks but 35% can be others small cap fund same 65 has to be small caps 35 can be others the 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 point is this if a stock is moving from mid, from uh, mid to large caps uh, uh, the large cap part of the market it's not as if the large cap fund has to has to necessarily buy it if this is not like the msci rebalance which we put out where you know uh, a passive money has to buy those stocks because they are part of the index against which th these funds are benchmarked this is not that uh, you know this others which is 20% uh, it could be mid cap small cap anything in the large cap category in the mid and small cap that is 35% discretion with mutual fund managers that makes all the difference so i just wanted to put this up for our viewers uh, and and make it clear that be careful when you look at these uh, sort of messages etc and say well let's buy that stock because institutional money now will have to pile into these names uh, and and that is not necessarily the case let me actually quickly bring in uh, our guests on to the show as well ashwini bhatia is managing director and ceo at spi mutual fund uh, ashish sumaya is uh, a boss at motila loswal mutual fund gentlemen thanks very much good morning both of you for joining us Mr. Bhatia, first up, congratulations from all of us here at CNBC TV 18. I think you've hit the uh, 400,000 uh, uh, sort of uh, AUM size at SBM at SBM Mutual Fund, so that's a sort of big landmark. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about you know the 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 classification which is going to come up. This is not new; it happens every six months. Uh, but just tell us if. you know the 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 relaxations which the industry was seeking from sebi that is still something which is being discussed and are you hopeful that that may happen go ahead yeah so thanks a lot uh, prashant so the reclassification of course happens every 6 months this is something that we are aware of and something that we mon monitor on a regular basis Uh, of course you also uh, told us and you know that flexibility is there within the scheme itself that if you you're a large cap fund you can you have to invest up to 80% in uh, in in large cap uh, stocks and if you are in mid cap and small cap then minimum of 65% have to be in that category uh, to your question that you know whether uh, a lot of reshuffling will happen or not and what will happen you know and obviously the top thing on your mind is volatility and many customers or many of your investors also look at this list now finally it doesn't really matter many times because mutual funds do track these numbers so for example a, a small cap fund that is already 80% into uh, say small cap and if there is any re reclassification something moves from um, small to mid or or the other way around uh, there may not be any reshuffling at all actually so even if say you are a you are a large cap fund and 80% you are supposed to keep in large cap and suppose you are at 100% so the move to you know from large cap to mid to to mid cap may actually not make any uh, difference may not make any difference that's the important point ashish come in here uh, what is your sense i mean just uh, uh, just tell us what happens and also uh, what happens if schemes are uh, finely balanced basically you know say for example if there is a mutual fund scheme which is exactly in that six, it's it's 65 35 so it doesn't leave too much leeway or discretion with uh, fund managers is that necessarily the case across industry or generally there is a fair bit of discretion with mutual fund managers when these changes do happen no i think uh, you know i get the drift and i'll just build on what you spoke before and what mr bhatia also replied i think first of all it's very clear there will not be too much of reshuffling let me explain the reason i'll build up on the example which you said that if there is a fund uh, first of all uh, none of us would keep it like on the brink and say that okay let's run only 65% exactly as mid cap and then let's keep 35% of the portfolio in stuff like large cap and small cap and stuff so let's build on that extreme example where somebody is really on the edge and you know first of all it's not practical it's not possible because share 
prices change every day and we don't know to breach so definitely nobody will be bang on 65 but theoretically let us say somebody is close to the 65 range and then 30th june uh, let's say there is a at the end of 30th june six month rolling average market cap etc let's say you get to know that uh, there is a stock which has actually uh, suddenly gone from mid cap and it has become either large cap or it has become a uh, small cap so first of all uh, you know uh, any portfolio manager would have a sense uh, that you know okay i am i'm ac- absolutely on the brink and then i also own one stock or two stocks uh, which are actually on the brink so that's a very extreme situation normally we all run 75 to 80% in mid cap and ideally speaking we should be running 100% in mid cap right and the point is that if i have to run 65% you know a mid cap fund is 65% in so called mid caps uh, then the other 35% gives you enough leeway so let's say you are running 75 to 80% mid cap on an average because like i said nobody will run on the brink so if you are 75 to 80% in uh, mid cap and let us say that so, so let's say there are three to four stocks okay uh, which suddenly change uh, the uh, categories so let's say you are at 75 to 80% in mid cap and you realize that four of those stocks Uh, you know, move from the mid cap into uh, large cap. That's a very happy situation to be in because you know you buy those mid caps in the hope that they will become large caps. But on the other hand, if you think that okay, there are four of those mid caps which are suddenly become small cap, then forget rebalancing the scheme. You should anyway be selling because you know you probably landed up with the wrong stuff. But I don't think those things really happen. Second thing, keep in mind is that apart from these huge thirty five percent leeways in which you can manage these uh, migrations of market cap ranges, apart from that. it has nearly you know uh, one i mean first of all you yourself as a portfolio manager you can observe what are the changes happening you don't need to wait till 30th june and secondly even if you are taken by surprise for some reason it gives you another one month uh, to rebalance and in such a large industry in everybody's portfolio there could be one or two stocks which migrate here and there like you rightly pointed the list from mid cap to large cap is barely uh, six seven stocks which means that six seven stocks will automatically fall from large cap into mid cap and then if you have all of those in your portfolio i don't think i mean such things don't happen i mean you know usually it could be one stock here and there and that also people run enough buffers uh, by utilizing the uh, flexibility that the regulator has already provided hmm gentlemen good morning uh, hearing all of your comments and i want to broaden this out to a larger question i mean ashish uh, i remember all the conversations we've had questioning the buckets themselves whether the time has come to Uh, enhance the category. I mean, the whole debate about how the large cap list, including just hundred stocks, top hundred market cap, whether that itself is right or not, and two fifty of the mid cap, whether the overall definition needs to be rewritten. I don't know if the regulator is thinking of that because even that keeps doing the rounds in the market every couple of months. But uh, your thoughts? See, I mean, uh, I, I, it's a matter of timing, uh, you know. After so, this came uh, basically 2018, mm. and after 2018, there has been significant depreciation uh, of assets. So, so, which means significant depreciation of AUM sizes, uh, inflows also. I mean, there have been positive inflows, but the fact is that yes, inflows are not what they were in 2017 or 2018. So, I think that's the reason why maybe this kind of discussion has taken a little bit of the little bit of a back seat, you know, because when share prices depreciate so much. And your EIN also depreciates. Then automatically, you know, uh, the uh, the capacity doesn't become that much of a constraint. Mm. You know, if you were, if your scheme sizes were really really large, and then you were told uh, that you know only 150 stocks is mid cap, then definitely you would appeal to the powers that be that you know you need to review this. That's the first point. Second point is in any case, in any case, uh, as the market uh, develops, as market caps rise, you know your your notion. For example, in the US, S and P 500 is perceived to be a large cap index. Now don't don't misunderstand me. We are nowhere close, but I'm just giving you an example for uh, our viewers to understand that eventually uh, there will be a point in time when these ranges will have to be reviewed uh, because we can't insist. For example, uh, you know, if uh, uh, right now a two fiftieth stock will be around seven thousand uh, crores or so, but there will be a time when the two fiftieth stock could be say twenty thousand crores or so. So you know, you'll obviously review uh, what is your mid cap range and what do you define as mid cap, etc. Sure. I think these are uh, Dependent on cycles also and market development also. Okay, so let me come to the cycle which in which we are in today, and Mr. Bhatia, that brings me to the, the question on the here and now. I'm looking at the last month figures. I mean, the May inflow figures and mid cap funds got in a net inflow of just about 279 crores. 
Now, since then, there's a, there's a broadening of the market. Since then, there's some excitement, a lot of uh, commentary around the reopening, etc. So, what are you seeing? Uh, are the mid cap and small cap category funds are they uh, getting more traction now? So, as a fund house, I mean, uh, we are very very careful, of course, and uh, we have seen decent flows in the last couple of months. Now, you know, typically when you talk about markets and flows and all that, uh, obviously uh, in the last few months, most of the flows have actually come into the large cap and focused uh, categories uh, as far as we are con concerned. So, I don't think it's right to actually always, you know, talk about small cap, mid cap. Uh, mutual funds, I think uh, it's still a long story if you ask me. And uh, it's more important that, you know, a customer actually stays focused. He has a goal in mind. But to your pointed question, you know, is there a slowdown? I don't think there is a, a, a slowdown. SIPs are uh, pretty much steady. We just saw a fall from maybe, maybe about 8,400 to about 8,100. On a yearly basis, that still accounts for about 1 lakh crores. That's a decent amount of uh, money. As a fund house, I think uh, we have been in a happy, sweet spot. We have not seen any uh, negative flows this so far uh, this year, which also explains the fact that you know we have crossed uh, four lakh crores in AUM, and the share also is higher significantly. Mm. Uh uh, gentlemen, uh, both Mr. Bhatia and Ashish, I know uh, you know you're in the run, uh, business of running the mutual fund and the portfolio call in terms of market direction is uh, to the up to the CIO and uh, portfolio managers. But uh, you know both of you are veterans uh, as well, Mr. Bhatia. What is your own sense? What is your perception of where the market is uh, at, uh, relative to uh, what the economy is doing right now and prospects for the economy? Uh, and how how does that translate into you know asset allocation decisions at this point for viewers who may be watching? Briefly, sir. So, you know, markets tend to underperform, overperform. You know, they hit both ends of the pendulum. Uh, as a fund house, we do bottom up investing. Uh, levels of the sensex and so on and so forth don't really matter. Uh, we hope that you know anyone who comes to us comes for the long term, long term capital appreciation, and we would like that to remain uh, in the way it is. Now, I have come on TV a couple of times, and you know when the Sensex was at close to twenty seven, twenty eight thousand, and everybody said, was it right time to sell, and was it the right time to stop your sips? Now, when that happens, do you stop a sip, or do you actually average more? So, you know, those kind of debates can always go on. But I think for a, for an investor who's entering the market, I think he should leave those decisions to the fund manager, look at the long run. And I think we have a long run, long, long way to go. Specifically, I mean, uh, you know, today you're just talking about equities. But let me also touch on the debt side. I think uh, we have gained significant traction as far as the debt is concerned. What we should be worried about, of course, more is that the debt market develops to a large extent. If the mutual fund debt flows increase, I think the economy benefits in a long way. The risk moves away from the bank and financial systems. That helps the government, that helps the promoters. You need lower equity there. So I mean, these are all long-term okay. issues yeah. but i think there's a long run mm. investors who are with us look at the long long run please oh, absolutely absolutely uh, ashish uh, under uh, you have under a minute <laughs> you know we, we spoke with uh, bse's ashish chauhan yesterday i put out a piece sometime back about the huge interest Amongst retail participants, we've been speaking with large brokers like Zerotha, etc. Trading is really uh, picked up around the world, including here in India as well. Are you seeing that as a, a, with new folio creations, etc., in mutual funds also, or this is what we are seeing is largely, uh, largely direct equity trading that we are talking about? 
No, it is happening in mutual funds also because even in mutual funds, you know, there is a huge a bunch of the population which is DIY digital first coming on these apps and the digital interfaces. So what what is uh, apply what applies to broking is apply. I have seen it applying to uh, mutual funds as well. So retail transactions are seriously on an upswing. And uh, I just want to you know add one simple thing on your previous question, which you mentioned about the economy and the markets. Now I don't know what's in store us store for us in the next two three months when the economic reality hits. So maybe you might see some turbulence. But I think what most people have forgotten in the recent times is that uh, you know we should not benchmark ourselves with the U.S. Because as far as India is concerned, at best or at worst, it's a slow speed car crash. You know, even before we hit COVID-19, our GDP growth was 4.3, 4.4%, and the system level credit growth was barely 6%. So, and you know, you see sectors like auto and stuff, which is the largest, one of the largest sectors in the economy. They were anyway going through pain and consolidation even before COVID-19 hit us. So, I think that you know, a high speed car crash is very different from a slow speed car crash. And my sense is that some of the impact is over exaggerated. Uh, you know, because every every conversation starts with situation on the ground, uh, but there's not enough discussion on what will happen when the dust settles. That's how I would put it. Okay, but maybe that is because no one knows, uh, you know, where the dust will settle or how thick the layer. Yeah, but eventually it will. Uh, so but eventually it will. Yeah. Yeah. Every time there is a massive economic yeah. slowdown. <laughs> No, every time, eventually it will, every time there is a massive economic slowdown, we always get out of it with very low interest rates, very high liquidity and very low inflation. And you know, some of those macro conditions are there, now it's just a question yes. of how long it takes. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, touche, as they say, and uh, let's keep our fingers crossed, hope for the best. Thanks very much. Great listening to, uh, listening to both of you, Ashish and Mr. Bhatia, for joining us. Mr. Bhatia, once again, congratulations on reaching the 4 lakh crore AUM uh, sort of milestone uh, and uh, thanks very much for being with us here on CNBC TV 18. We'll take a very quick break here, our first on the show, we are back in two.